I focus on trying to understand the impacts of humans on the water cycle. So that's what I what I really like to see. What what is it that it's changing water on Earth? Um, okay, so going back to this, only two point five percent of the water on Earth is not salty, so it's fresh. So we can that's the water that we consume, that we humans consume for drinking for use that ecosystems need uh, to thrive. So we're all fighting for 2.5% of all the water on Earth. And to make things worse, 1.7% of this water is, in, is as ice, so we cannot, we cannot use it. And then only 0.77% of all this water is actually, we can reach it. So much of it is hidden beneath the ground. We cannot use it or in Antarctica, which is also very far away. So, so we're all fighting for, for, for almost, for less than 1% of the water. And by all we mean humans and also all living, living organisms on Earth, right? And I'm not gonna go through the boring stuff of hydrology, but, but you can see water as flow, as, 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 as an element flowing around the Earth, but also as stocks. So, so for, this is the, you can, you have water on the oceans, of course, but you can also have water in lakes, you can have water in rivers. You also have plenty of water beneath the ground. And that's in some countries or areas of the world, that's actually the water that is used to grow agriculture and to grow crops. Or here in Sweden, in the countryside, or also in Germany, well, that's mostly the water that feeds all the, uh, your households when, you, when you're living out in the countryside. But there's also a lot of water in the atmosphere in the form of vapor. And, and most of the water is actually always in the atmosphere, right? So most of the water, we cannot use it. OK, and the, why is water important? Well, obviously, you, you, you might think about why is water important for you, because we're always thinking on us, right, humans? But water is also important because water actually regulates the climate on Earth. If we didn't have a belt of water vapor around the Earth, we would be freezing, right? Because water is actually the, the globus, the, 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 the largest and a global warming element, right? So, but it's natural. Right? And then it also, because of this, it also dampens the temperature fluctuations. That's why we have stable, more or less stable temperatures on Earth. But it also water is also it also moves and transports substances from the from the high mountains to the valleys, from the valleys to the ocean. So that's what's dry, moving not only important elements for ecosystems but also pollutants, right? And it also allows biochemical processes. So, for instance, geochemical processes that that make important chemical elements for or organisms in lakes or in oceans can only occur if there's water, right? Or also uh, important reactions in the atmosphere can only occur if there's water. And obviously then all, almost all biomass on earth depends on water. And finally for us, water is completely important. We need it for food production, not only agriculture, but also livestock. We need it for drinking, for uses, for households, industries also need a lot of water, for instance, for, for energy. So we can regulate water for hydro, by hydropower, but we also need water to control the temperature in thermal, in thermal plants or nuclear plants. We also use it as transportation and as recreation. So water has plenty, plenty, plenty of functions, not only for us, but also for the earth, right? So the question is, how much can water resources take of the print that we're putting in all these water resources, right? So, so we're in a point where all this, maybe I have, I have this, this graph of, of, of the last 50, showing the impact of humans on the last 50 years across a multiple sector. So you see that since 1950, world population has exploded, exploded exponentially. GDP, foreign investment means that uh, resources are flowing around the earth like crazy. That has increased the, the use of energy, 
the impoundment of reservoirs with dams, the use of water, paper production, uh, internet, like all this requires plenty of resources, energy and water resources. So, so how much water, how, how much can all these water resources that we do kind of really take? Right? So is it like, are we in a stable state? Is the, it, or is it already the question nowadays in sustainability is, are we, are we treating water way beyond its limits? So that's, that's a way to put it. So, so that's a little bit of the, of the work that we do here in my group or also with, uh, with my colleagues. So uh, I was also in the Stockholm Resilience Center for some time. And we have a group where we're uh, where led, for instance, now some studies by Lan Wang, she's a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center. We're trying to determine really what are the boundaries or the, the safe operating space regarding water. And we and after some after after many developments in the last ten years regarding planetary boundaries, as you all know, well they come here from Sweden, uh, made by Johan Rockström's group. Uh, but water is complicated because really, is there a, a, a number that can tell us how much, how sustainable is our use of water? So can we do that? But we found that actually it is very complicated. So we actually have to see all these different dimensions of water as we were to show here in all these compartments of water. So we, we need to understand water, the limits of water in each of these compartments. And that's why we're talking about so boundaries of, of, of water. So in order to talk about the sustainability of water. Okay, so so there are two main ways in which humans affect directly water, water resources. First is land use, and second is water use. So land use is basically the conversion of vegetation or the conversion of land uh, for our main activities like agriculture or urbanization. Um, so for instance, this is a map by Ramakuti showing, showing I think from 20 years ago, showing the amount of pastures and cropland on earth. So just imagine the changes that this land conversion ha has made from the water cycle for the water cycle. Remi remember that the, all this water moves from the earth to the atmosphere, from the atmosphere back to the to the surface to the ocean. So if you change the vegetation, this vegetation is constantly transpirating the surface of the earth. It's evaporating water all the time. So if you change all this vegetation coverage, well, you're actually changing the the fluxes of water. So all this large scale conversion of, of, of land will has also implications for the water cycle. And now also regarding water use. So you know that we impound water in reservoirs by constructing dams with multiple purposes. So we, 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 we store water in reservoirs because we need water when we don't have it in some periods of the year in, in, in specific areas of the world. But we also need water to, to generate electricity. We also need water to, for transport in some cases. So there's many, many reasons of impounding water in reservoir. This is a map by Leonard, a recent map by Bernard Leonard from McGill University, showing the, the free flowing rivers on earth. So, which more or less are seen by uh, on blue, uh, by the color blue, and on the other side you have the most impacted rivers on Earth, showing show, shown by the color red. So you see, for instance, that uh, countries like like mine, Colombia is rather blue, uh, and Sweden. Well, Sweden is also you would consider it rather blue, but it's not that true, right? <laughs> Actually, not all. Not Sweden doesn't have a lot of free flowing rivers. Yeah. I think of basically the Oreven and maybe one or two more, but basically all of them are being regulated for hydropower. So this has implications also for all these functions of water that we were talking about, the flow of the flow of elements in the water, of minerals, and the act the, the migration of species that migrate through this river. So there's also plenty of impact. But there's also another issue of why, why we 
store water and it's also to use it later on, for instance, for irrigation. So a lot of the places on earth, actually the, with the highest agriculture, do not have water. So we need to store that water to use it for agriculture. Okay, so that comes into a concept that, that, that you've heard around that it's called the water footprint. So the water footprint in, in, in simple terms is actually water consumption. So water consumption is not the same as water use. Why? Because water use is we take the water, we do something with the water, but then we, take, we throw it back, we, we put it back into the system. So for instance, when we're having a shower here in Stockholm, we're using the water to clean ourselves, but then that water goes through the drains, through the pipes, and then goes back, back to, the, to, the, to, the, to the lake or back to the, to the Baltic Sea, right? So it's still in the system. However, consumption is when we use the water and we do something to it so that it doesn't come back to where it originally was. And that's what irrigated agriculture does. We take water from a lake or from a, ground, a groundwater aquifer, and we use it to use a to grow a crop, and that crop evaporates or transpires that water, and that water goes to the atmosphere and then comes back by rain somewhere else. But it can be on top of on the on on another country, in another area of the world, over the ocean, etc. So that is water consumption when we use water, but we do not return it from where it comes from. And this is the water footprint. So you see, for instance, that countries of high Water footprints are India, the United States, Brazil, and almost entirely uh, uh, Middle and Southern Europe, because the water is actually being used for agriculture and not coming back to the system. So imagine the amount of water that we're using worldwide. So the water footprint is actually, was actually estimated to be 9,000 cubic kilometers per year of water. And based on some studies that we did six years ago, we found that actually that was a, an underrepresentation of the real consumption of humans. So the real consumption of humans can go up to almost 11 cubic kilometers of water if you take into account all this water that is evaporating from all these reservoirs or, or, or that is evaporating from irrigation. And 11 thousand square kilometers of water equals more or less so that you can see the volume it's 70 times Lake Bevan in Sweden. So that's the water that humans consume every year. And then obviously you have you, you have some some sectors that consume more water than others. So irrigation consumes a lot of water and that's blue. But also we have a lot of water that we really do not account that is consumed by cattle and rain fed agriculture. Okay, so I don't have, I think I have around five minutes left. So I'll just, I, I just wanted to go through a, a case that I, that actually we've done uh, plenty of research on that it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful wetland in Colombia, where I come from. It's called the Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta. It's a Ramsar site. It's a, it's a biosphere reserve. It's actually the size, almost the size of the Everglades, which is this very popular wetland, mangrove, mangrove wetland in, in Florida in the United States, but this one is not very well known. So it's there in Northern Colombia. And it has been the subject of all these impacts that I've talked about, they're all here. So, so this is the, it is actually, so here you see in blue, the Magdalena River, which feeds half of the, of the country. So all the water that, fall, that that comes in Colombia, that falls down in Colombia by precipitation, ends up coming out to the Caribbean through this river. So this is the delta of the river, right? and it has it's covered by mangroves. So it it is or it was a beautiful wetland until in the last forty years, Colombian engineers like me decide to construct construct two big roads. So one road connected the city of Barranquilla, which is where Shakira comes from with the city of Santa Marta, which is up there. And then another city went through the, went along the river to some agricultural areas down here. And then also here in this area that I'm pointing with the mouse, that there's a lot of banana and palm plantations. This is the area where Gabriel Garcia Marquez has based all his books on say a hundred years of solitude, et cetera. So there's so much water consumption for, for this industry that 
not allow a lot of water ends up in the Sienaga anymore. To the point where mangrove populations have decreased drastically from 500 square, kilome square kilometers of mangroves that, that is going on your car for more than 20 kilometers without seeing mangroves all the time. And, and it has almost dropped by half at the beginning of the 21st century. And all this, because of this mess that we generated, this is a, a photo of the year 2000. So this is the, where mangroves died because of hypersalinization. If you have water with salt and you remove the water, what do you have left? The salt. So the mangroves can tolerate salt, but not that much. So that's why all these mangroves have died because lack of water and salinization of the soils. But you cannot uh, forget the impacts of climate change, like dry, dry climates with uh, imply more evaporation, less water to the wetland. Also, what about pollution? This is the, the delta draining half of Colombia. So this is how it still looks in the year 2017. So you see these red areas down there, they're actually, when you see red, it means salt. So all these are salted lakes. Uh, and this is a, look the water on the other side, that's fresh water. So you see all these dead mangroves. And this is, for instance, you can see to, to the horizon. These were, these were beautiful wet mangrove wetlands in the 60s and the 70s and not anymore. And obviously the Colombian, the Colombian authorities, environmental, political, everything have tried really hard to improve the wetland, but, but it's not possible. Like something has been done already. There has been a small improvement, but it will never be what it was. And then these are, for instance, what, 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 what it's been trying to, what, what the authorities are trying to do. They're trying to improve the, 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 the flow of wetland within the, the flow of water within the wetland, trying to bring more water into the wetland. But politics, the, the people that own the, <laughs> the farms around this wetland, a lot of them are politics, people that are very rich. And obviously like, well, a lot of things can be done, but the most important things like bringing back water to the wetland is not done. Okay, so this was a very, iconic example that I wanted to share with you. So in conclusion, water is limited, as you all know. And we, we, affect, we affect water directly, not only by water use, but also by land use. And we're consuming a lot of water. Is it sustainable? And the, and the main question is, can then all the ecosystems that surround us cope with these impacts? So I leave you then with this like pop-up questions and comments. Um, yeah. Thanks.